Revolution, and welcome to Good Morning Revolution, the place where we debate, discuss, uh, construct, deconstruct, reconstruct. Uh, Rosanna and Michael and Good morning, Anita. Good morning, Revolution. There good morning, you know. Revolution. <laughs> Michael, good morning, Revolution. Good morning, you Revolution. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. So, uh, Afghanistan, uh, terrorist bombing from ISIS-K. Soldiers dead, Afghan civilians dead, Taliban dead, terrible. Um, I didn't realize there were all this infighting amongst these different sects, uh, but oh my goodness. You know, war and rumors of war. It's like a permanent war. We've got to find a way to bring all of this to an end. Uh, but the first step has been taken with the uh, U.S. withdrawal, Anita. Um, that's really important, don't you think? Absolutely. I mean, that was the first step, and we, we've taken it. I think what we're seeing now with this uh, ISIS-K is um, some more... Uh, results of the seeds that were planted by the CIA itself in the 1980s, supporting these fundamentalist groups against the Soviet Union at the time. So I think that, uh, I mean, those, th that, those actions are gonna have repercussions for years in advance, but I think uh, getting us out of there and, um, uh, is, is really the first step and we'll see what change can happen from within Afghanistan. Poison fruit, those seeds grew. Oh my goodness. Rosanna, the parents of those who died, they must, they on the verge of the end, so close, and then sons and daughters dead. You know, uh, I'm sure you can you know, relate the, to that. Yeah. That's the very first thing that came into my mind when I read how many had, how many of the soldiers had passed away. You know, as parents are looking forward to their children coming home and uh, and they're torn. I, I, I really believe that they're torn because on the one hand, you you're you're glad your loved one is coming home. But on the other hand, you hear you see all of this destruction and chaos and things like that. And so it's a it's a difficult thing because, you know, the Afghan people are so will be suffering. But they were suffering before. And I think that's an important point to remember is that if our presence didn't prevent them from going without food, going with, you know, having all of these challenges. In fact, our presence was uh, made it worse. So yeah, the, the soldiers that lost their lives, uh, it's just it's a, it's a shame. It's, it's just horrifying um, when you lose a loved one. And, and I, but I think it's also really important to remember that our presence doesn't make a difference in terms of the safety of anybody. In fact, it probably makes it worse. So we need to get out of there. So true. So true. Michael, I see you got on your Batman brim. I do. Yeah. Give me an excuse to wear my yeah. brim this Af morning. Afghanistan needs a superhero. No, it, you know, I was thinking of how complex Afghanistan is. You know, they've had... I was watching this great documentary the other day and it talked about the history of like when they had kind of that constitutional monarchy, bourgeois democracy and how the women didn't have to wear headscarves and everything. And they were, you know, they could study at the university freely. Then they had socialism and then the Taliban, US occupation and back to the Taliban. And it made me want to research kind of like these political progressive um, grassroots social movements and political parties. And they have a handful of, um, you know, even socialist oriented and communist oriented parties like the Afghanistan United uh, nation party, which has played a role in the last government uh, that was just, you know, kind of kicked out. And then the National Enlightenment Co Consensus Party of Afghanistan, uh, the National United Party of Afghanistan, Solidarity Party of Afghanistan. I don't know how big all these are and how much influence they have, but it seems like there is enough, you know, pro-democratic forces, uh, whether they're banned or exiled or whatever, who can get together and really, you know, usher in um, a new period of, uh, you know, hopefully a, a peaceful period uh, in history, a new chapter in history for the Afghan people, because it has to be up to them. We can't, you know, the United States can't go in there and stick their foot in everything. It has to be up to them. So we can only hope for the best. We need to follow the prime directive. Yes. Star Trek. 
You know, no interference <laughs> in other planets uh, development. You just can't do it, you know? When are they gonna learn? Prime directive, no interference. You know, I was listening to Sean Penn the other day. He has a new movie out, by the way. <clears throat> and the guy asked him, he said, well, what do you think about what happened? Was it uh, policy or was it inevitable? And Sean Penn said, look, it's a crisis right now. It's a crisis, we need to focus on the crisis. After the crisis, we can have a postmortem. We can, we can analyze but right now the humanitarian crisis should be, occupy all of our uh, attention. Speaking of which, there's gonna be a crisis of homelessness in this country. The Supreme Court, enemy of the people. That's right. On two occasions yep. this week. First on immigration, you can't come into the country and apply for asylum. They say stay in Mexico, stay Nigeria, stay in Haiti, stay wherever you are, don't come here. And then next day, or day after, they said on the eviction moratorium, oh, sorry guys, it doesn't apply. That agency doesn't have the authority. Mm -hmm. It has to be left to Congress, Anita. Right. It's just, it's it, what we're seeing is the five, uh, four majority of, uh, or the six, three majority of uh, conservatives on the, on the court uh, putting, I mean, it, it, uh, requiring the reinstatement of a Trump policy uh, in, on the border, uh, that state return, return, what is it, stay in Mexico or, or but, it, but it has some euphemistic name, migrant protection protocols, they call it, you know, which is the opposite mm. of what it actually does. So um, yeah, I mean, there, it's that uh, you know, Trump's presidency is over, but he um, his presidency left you know certain things in place that will be in place for a while on the Supreme Court, and we have to we have to really get our legislature in to to fight that, uh, or get the people you know people's movement to really demand uh, you know more progressive policies on the eviction question, housing. Um, and uh, as well as the migrant policy, protecting uh, refugees who, the reason there we have a refugee crisis on the border is because of the United States imperialist policies in the first place. So we have to, uh, we have to own that and help them integrate into the United States if, the, if that's what they want to do. Well, so I want them to take two of them right wingers and make them homeless for a week. And then let them vote again and see how it feels. Because homelessness, yeah. uh, you know, the unhoused, it's a terrible thing not to have any place to go. I you think, know? you know, I, I, I think what, what we need to also look at is that it really, really did matter to have who we had in, in office when it came to electing these, these judges. The other thing is that we need to push to stop this nonsense about that they're there for life. We need to, you know, or expand it. We, I, I don't know, I don't know. I, I've never been, been able to fully understand the purpose of these Supreme Court justices being there for life. And so, you know, and, and how can they be um, not, uh, what do you call it, uh, judges when we clearly know where side they're on? It, that doesn't, that never made any sense to me either. So I think the problem is going to be the homelessness is here in Los Angeles, it's, it's out of control really. And all they're trying to do is push them out, uh, make it illegal to go to be homeless. Hmm. You know, it's just ridiculous, very, very ridiculous. And we have to rally around this and change the situation. And there's a lot of good organizations that we can get involved with. You know, there's a certain barbarity in the mm -hmm. allowing this kind of homelessness to take place. Michael, I saw they put these spikes, these jagged spikes uh, on the frame of fire hydrants so you can't sit on them. You know, they don't want people to sit and they do it on bus stops. They put little ridges on it so that the seat, you can't sleep on it. And uh, I mean, it's just, 
government and humanity to man. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's just, you know, terrible. You got people sleeping on the street, Michael, in New York. I mean, no mattress, no sheet, no blanket, no. In the sun, in the everywhere, street. on the pavement, yeah. It reminds me of Bogota when I was there in the 70s. Just human misery everywhere you look. We need a revolution, y'all, to, you know, we gotta, this is madness. In the richest, most developed country on earth. Right. It, it's, something. it's something. I had a friend who came here to visit um, from Mexico a couple weeks ago, you know, and he very impoverished part of Mexico. He's from uh, Tepito, which is the most impoverished neighborhood in Mexico City, you know, very dangerous, high crime rate. And he came to get his COVID vaccine because um, he was low on the list of getting in Mexico. So he came, saved up money, came here, got the COVID vaccine. And he said, you know, how do you guys have so much poverty here? We don't see that in the movies. We watch these American movies. We want to be American. You know, we, we glorify the way you, you all live. But I never imagined this. This was his first time in the United States to New York City. And it was, it, it, I knew people felt that way, you know, when they would come here. I've been told that by Brazilian friends who came to visit, but it impacted me again because it's gotten so worse since the pandemic. So much, you know, families living in the streets. I've seen a, a wife, a husband, and their two dogs living in the street. Weren't on drugs or anything, just over there in front of the Home Depot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's inexplicable sometimes to people who, from an outside perspective, you know, what happened? I knew, we know you live under capitalism and everything, but come on, this is a whole nother level. Because uh, over on 26th Street, there was a building that had ledges that were about five feet up, you know, but people used to sleep on the ledges, get up off the ground, you know, because you got rats in New York. You got <laughs> rats as big as dogs, and you know, I mean, you got big ass rats. And I don't blame them, so they put, so they were sleeping on the net. They put up a fence <laughs> so that you couldn't sleep. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, just to prevent people from. Um, um, it's, but we got a three trillion dollar bill mm -hmm. that the Democrats passed. Not one single Republican vote. It's a fascist party. Maybe that's too strong, but the teetering on it, $3 trillion human infrastructure bill, Anita. Right. I it's, mean, what's in it? It's, me? <laughs> it has something, in it, me? it has something in it for everybody. And, and, and I think it has, um, I mean, it has more than one thing in it for everybody. It has tax benefits for the middle class and repealing those uh, tax credits that the Trump administration gave to the extremely uh, wealthy. And it has a lot of family friendly policies like uh, child care support it has in home um, in home care for older adults and disabled people, something that I used to work. I used to work at the home care in, uh, in New York uh, City. And there's $400 billion in the bill for just that. And that would be such a, a, a blessing, to, not a blessing, it will be a, 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 a resource for people who are um, dealing with elderly parents. Um, it's got really good transportation uh, uh, stuff that's green, green energy is built into every, every aspect. So it really just have, has a lot of good things. Those child tax credits that cut child poverty in half, they would be made permanent with this uh, with this bill. So uh, it's it's gonna be really good and everyone loves it. It's a very popular bill, except among Republican senators, unfortunately. Just those now when you say people. benefit the middle class, do you mean the working class or do you mean small <laughs> shopkeepers? I'm just wondering. I what do. It's a qu good question. What is the middle class? I, I am talking about middle income people um, and working class. I mean, working class people are in many cases, middle income people. Um, so I think that's, uh, you know, having things like, and I'm thinking about single women and, and single parent families, uh, having universal pre-K for, uh, for those children is incredibly important. Free uh, community college 
tuition for the first two years, getting people better ed educated for uh, the you know uh, good jobs in the uh, in the future. So I just think there's just very many benefits for working people, uh, working families in this in this bill. I hope there's no money in it for the border wall, Rosanna. <laughs> in fact, I read yesterday that 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 they're dismantling that wall. It's that, falling somebody apart. Somebody told me that. Oh no, Biden and Harris—they're doing the Trump wall. They're, they're a bunch of freaking phonies. But I read that's not true. No, it's not true. I, I, it, some of that some of that wall is falling apart even before before Biden got there. It was just a, it was a cheap mess. Uh, but um, yeah, no, it's that's not true. I think you know there's. There's a lot of reason to be hopeful for an immigration reform. And uh, we, of course, it's the people that have to push it. You know, it's the people who made this infrastructure bill, uh, <clears throat> all of these bills possible. So we have to keep pushing. We have to keep, uh, you know, making sure that all, not just the middle class is represented, but uh, are benefits from it, but also all, all, uh, all people of uh, the United States, everybody that lives here. Uh, first and foremost, you know, we have to take care of our own. We're out there, you know, in somebody else's business in Afghanistan and all of those other places. And we're not even taking care of our own. And I think as people, we need to insist that we need to take care of our own here first. You know, we, we, our country isn't that great if, if our people are going hungry or are living in the streets. Absolutely. I know I'm going to get accused of being a Biden boosting right opportunist tailors. But the truth is the truth. When they do wrong, you gotta criticize it. But when people make up shit, you know, you gotta you gotta destroy this fake news, you know what I mean? And 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 and, and uh because we got enough problems without, you know, contributing to uh phoniness. On the other hand, Michael. <clears throat> The Democratic forces are saying that the Biden administration needs to take a firmer stand on voting rights. That's right. Voting rights. Yeah, and you know, voting uh, rights. And the, and I'm going to Washington tomorrow to that's, participate in the demonstration for voting rights called by the civil rights leadership. I'm going to be there representing Michael, and and uh, um, that's really important. This fight for voting rights and, and the point that who, who, who made the point that about the Supreme Court that these people who are on it matter, elections matter. And all you ultra leftists, you phony Marxists who say that elections don't matter. Get out of here with that nonsense, Michael. Not you. No, I agree. Person, no, I, agree. I, mean, I agree. We no, gotta I go down to DC and demand voting rights. I agree. And, and it's the same with the prior topic on immigration. I'm sitting here thinking about um, what the situation would be with voting rights and with immigration had the pro, and I'm talking Democratic with a small d, had all these non-fascist, non-Republican people turned out in the polls in 2020, what it would look like. And so, you know, I married an immigrant. I'm not so sure, uh, given my politics and, and, you know, where he comes from, Mexico, that he would even have his visa right now uh, had the previous administration stayed in. You know, that's kind of a person, but then I'm looking at voting rights and the, in my opinion, of almost a miracle that was pulled off in Georgia. Who would have thought that a young Jewish guy and a uh, black pastor would have been elected the two senators, Democratic uh, Party senators from Georgia, conservative Republican run Georgia, you know? It was like, what? It, it surprised everyone. And so, you think about how all these forces on the ground during the Trump administration was mo where they were mobilized, you know, around the issues of immigrant rights, voting rights, you know, and, and then to gerrymandering and so forth. And so it's not that Biden and Harris that, you know, their administration, they're, they're making all these policy changes from the goodness of their own heart. And of course, they can be much more progressive and, you know, uh, I guess, radical on these issues. But had it not been for all these people going out in the millions demonstrating for Black Lives Matter and uh, against ICE, you know, abolish ICE, I don't think they'd even be taking these positions at all. They wouldn't be ha we haven't, wouldn't be having this conversation at all right now. We'd be back to, you know, zero. 
And so at least I feel like we have something to fight for and to defend and, and expand. Speaking of Georgia, you know, Herschel Walker, the Heisman Trophy, tremendous. He's running against Warnock. What's the matter with that cat? Uh, somebody needs to take him out and have a conversation with him. I mean, he's, anyway, then the people of Georgia will deal with that issue. I'm sure that, and it was a miracle. I didn't believe that that was going to happen in Georgia. I was like, oh my goodness. Mm. And then boom, there was this democratic explosion. Rosanna and the people showed up and Stacey Abrams and the other sisters and brothers and, and people of all walks and persuasions came out and, and said, uh, we're not taking this nonsense no more. And they even forced the Republicans <laughs> the Secretary of State for once in his life to take a good position. I think he's backtracked since then. <laughs> anyway, mm. keep the pressure on. We're going to D.C. tomorrow. Ain't nobody going to stop us. Ain't nobody oh, going to stop us. Yeah. There, there's, if for those people who can't go to D.C., there's um, demonstrations all across the country. We have one in Columbus tomorrow afternoon. So, uh, you know, I think there's other opportunities to uh, come out for the uh, voting rights. Well, I want y'all to hold the red flag high. <laughs> uh, the party banner. Uh, uh, we want to see pictures, video. Okay. <laughs> we want an article for the People's World and CPUSA.org. We got to represent. We have a, Rosanna, we got a party building drive coming up. Yes, we do. We got to get, we got to get more members, more, uh, activists out there on the streets. I mean, you know, join the Communist Party. We're going to be fighting, running for office, engaging in sit-ins, occupations, uh, every area of struggle where we can move masses of people. That's where you're going to find us. Well, I right. think that does it for this week. Do we have any programs coming up? Sunday? I don't think so. No programs, but you can check March on for votingrights.org. March on for votingrights.org to see where there's a demonstration for voting rights this weekend in, in your area. And so all the unions and progressive grassroots organizing uh, organizations are mobilizing for this. So be there or be square. March on. That's it for this week. Stay safe, stay strong. COVID is increased. Delta. Stay in the fight and wear your mask while you're doing it. Take care, everybody. Get your vaccine. Bye. March on. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.